can make it clear. Order. 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 He is the leader of the Conservative Party, the ever satirical Colin Craig, and he is the Associate Professor of the School of Communication Studies at AUT, Media Oracle, Dr. Wayne Hope. Welcome to you both. Coming up tonight, issue one, what now for the Māori Party and what are Key's coalition options post-2014? Issue two, the new GCSB powers legalising domestic spying are gliding through Parliament why are New Zealanders so apathetic to this law? In issue three tonight, if the city rail link is such a good idea, why aren't we starting it now rather than 2020? And should we be banning beggars from Queen Street? Plus, we'll end the show in the final word, but let's kick things off tonight with issue one. Coming third in the Ikaroa Rafferty by-election seems to have shocked the Māori Party into dumping Peter Sharples as leader in the hope of reviving their political fortunes. But is a change of leader enough? And who will John Key be able to form a government with post-2014? Wayne, will a change of leader in the Māori Party be enough? Or is there simply too much of a class difference between most Māori voters and most National Party voters? Oh, I think you put your nail on it for the, you know. Um, but if you look at Māori society as a whole, there's a class structure in there, widening class divisions within Māori society, and mana is picking up the poorest Māori voters. It's picking up the flax roots. Now, when the Māori Party first started, it was they who were picking up the flax roots mm. um, off people who used to vote for Labour. Uh, and now mana's doing it. I mean, that result is pretty significant. And I think the Māori Party's chances of the next election are not great. Were they shocked? I mean, they seem to have not understood what sitting at John Key's table was going to buy them. Yeah, that seems to be the case. Um, yeah, it's pretty inevitable what happened, really, because the Maori Party has shifted further and further to the right on economic issues. And uh, the Iwi Leaders Group, for example, is a very conservative organisation, mm. um, corporate aligned. And those are not the kind of organisations um, which are going to suit the needs of the poorest Maori. So. Mm. Um, there's a real niche there, and the Māna Party has exploited it. And I think um, the Māori Party leadership has just been a little bit overconfident about their capacity to ride this out. Mm. And uh, this last private, this last by-election is a real wake-up call. They will argue, look, we've been at the table, we're not spectators, we're players in this game, we have delivered for Māori voters. Is that a fair statement from them? Oh, not really. As the economy's got worse, as unemployment's really, really kicked in, and as social polarisation is just part of the furniture, um, then it's about delivering to your grassroots or your flax roots, and they just haven't done that. And so they were always going to be vulnerable uh, once uh, Hone Hararera um, won that by-election. Yeah. Colin, act your political joke. United mm -hmm. Future can't muster 500 members to even be a party, <laughs> and the Māori Party are in crisis. When does John Key offer you a cup of tea in Rodney? Well, I think firstly, we've got to recognise there are going to be boundary changes. And so you say Rodney, but the reality is where I live is probably going to be a brand new electorate. Okay. Um, and I think if, if there is going to be that sort of offer, if you like, made, I think uh, once the new electorate boundaries come out, yeah. I would expect if National are going to indicate anything our way, they'd start thinking about it at that point in time. So there's new been, electorate so there's been with enough no of a, incumbent. enough of a population boost there to increase it? Or is it highest growth in the country, right, so it, has, right, to, it right. has to, somehow there has to be a new seat there. Right. So I, I, I would think if you're talking about that, then that's probably... I would suggest what National should be looking at. New seat, where I will stand, where I've yep. got a lot of popularity. Yep. Or maybe they'll give me a free pass. I don't know, but if they're that desperate, that's the sort of thing I would be looking at. Strategically, it would make sense, would it not? Well, look, I think what we're seeing is a shrinking of the political landscape. I mean, the reality is we've had a lot of these little small parties in Parliament. Uh, I think United Future are gone. Act maybe win a seat if it's a freebie from National, mm. but otherwise, no. Yep. Uh, and that really means that you've got New Zealand first, Conservative, and then look, it wouldn't surprise me if sometime Mana and Murray did, you know, I mean, no, I know Honey's suggesting it, yeah, isn't he? Saying, well, yep. why don't you guys come back into the fold yep. with me rather than the other way around, which I love. Um, and because I think going forward, 
we're going to see this shrinking landscape. And for John Key, his big danger is he might be the most popular Prime Minister ever yep. to lose an election because it's about the minor players now. So with, let's say, Conservative Party, you know, let's say you have a good, good, good night. Yep. Uh, you poll 3.5, let's, oh, say. let's say. let's come on. Well, yeah, a good let's night is a, a good night. A good night's a lot more than that. Okay, but but you also win, let's say, this, this, yeah. this electorate. You bring in a whole bunch of other MPs mm -hmm. with you. That's a party that John Key can sit down and talk with. Is, is that we have know? always said we'll talk to the highest polling party first, and we would try to work with them to make government work. Yep. So at least John Keyes knows we're an option. I think many of the others that are going to be left now are not going to be options. For have him. you had any unofficial talks with National? No. Nothing? No. When will you know about this new electorate? I believe when, we when know it? in September okay. this year. Yep. yep. Uh, it won't be finalised till the next year. Yep. A and look, at that point, we'll be making decisions about where I stand. Right. Uh, Wayne, New Zealand First has ruthlessly, ruthlessly pursued uh, done to eliminate National Party coalition options. Would Key be foolish to rely on Winston without the security of being able to go the other way with the Conservative Party? Would he want to play Winston off? Oh, I think it's too premature to talk like that. I think the Prime Minister's strategy is, number one, to make himself look as though he's the only electable Prime Minister. Right. He's the only one who's got the experience and he's up for the job. Mm. And that in itself will affect the vote. Okay, mm. so subtly downgrading Sarah's capacity yep. to lead yep. and demonising the Greens. Yep. The second part of his strategy is to diss and undermine um, any prospect of an opposition coalition coming to power. Right. Um, which means, again, demonising the Greens. Now, if those two aspects of his strategy, if they work, then his options on election night are going to be pretty good. Right. So it's important here from John Key's point of view um, not to jump to conclusions, not to start thinking about who I can negotiate with until he's performed those other two tasks first. Yeah, Colin, I'm, I'm, are you, I'm not are you, sure I agree with I'm not sure I agree with that. I mean you look at when Shearer questioned Key in the House and said, Well, you're running out of friends mm, mm. Uh, I mean Key could point to us, he could point to New Zealand first. But the reality is uh, the Labour Greens vote is going to be very similar to the national vote next election, give or take a percent. I yep. think everyone thinks that. That means the, the minor players will decide it. And um, look, national should be forward planning just like Labour are should. You, be. Are, are you, you heard of the politics hold on, hold on, of hold on, fear? Hold on, hold on, I mean, yeah, yeah, politics of fear works. <laughs> are you easier to deal with than Winston Peters? Oh, I think that, are you? Oh, I think absolutely, actually. What are your bottom lines? Well, look, we've always said a bottom line is that um, a clear result in a citizens initiated referenda should be binding. Uh, I have no doubt that that is a bottom line for us. And secondly, accountability on spending. We want to know where the money's going and what sort of return we're getting for our dollars. Those are actually quite easy bottom lines to live with. If they offer you a cabinet position, let's Not just say, let's say, let's say, let's yep. say, let's say, they offer you a cabinet position, yep. but just drop the silly referendum stuff. Not going to happen. Are you saying seriously yep. that referendum, the binding element of referendum, is, is, your, is your bottom line? For a clear majority vote, which is two-thirds, yes. Wow. Mm. Okay. <laughs> One question of both of you. Uh, how many seats will the Māori Party hold post-2014? Have oh. they got three now? What do you think? Oh, one at the most. One at the most? No, I could go up to two. You go up to two? Yeah. Thank you, panel. Moving on with our second issue tonight, the passing of new law allowing the GCSB to spy on domestic targets, something expressly forbidden in the original GCSB legislation, continues to glide through Parliament despite the interesting exchange between Kim.com and John Key without really much public outrage. Colin, help me out here. New Zealanders were on the streets outraged at the closing of a legal loophole being used by parents who were facing assault charges because that was too nanny state. Too nanny state. Yet here we have a government wanting to legally spy on all of our online mm -hmm. metadata minus any of that social backlash. How is stopping a parent using discipline as a defence from assault nanny state? How is that nanny state? Yet the government's spying on everything I do online that's not nanny state. Look, they're both nanny state. Uh, and while I think there are a lot of New Zealanders who are apathetic, uh, because we're the party that is limited government, pro-freedom, liberty, and we see this as a, as a major step backwards. See, we are getting a lot of support. We get people write to us every day about this. I think to say that New Zealanders are, are apathetic on this, 
maybe look maybe a lot of them are but but they're not all like that and at our end of you know and what we deal in terms of political ground this is great for us we've got people signing up every day going well flip i don't want the government spying on me so interestingly enough this is one that i think um an issue that appeals a lot to our core voters does john they key just have don't it wrong here does john key have it wrong oh, i think he does i think i think he does in the sense of what's right for new zealanders and their freedom mm. but i'm not sure is this just a john key decision or is this something that's part of a of a more of a global alliance? Hey, we're giving you a push to to get a bit more invasive. Are we, are we under threat from any terrorism in New Zealand? Look, New Zealand? Not, not that I believe. I think the step here that where you're going to say that private companies now yes. become an extension of government's power to yes. spy is very yes. alarming. Yes. Uh, when I sign a deal with telecom, when anyone signs a deal with telecom or any other provider, I'm giving telecom a right. I'm not by default giving the government a right yes. to know what I'm up to or to yes. use telecom's equipment. This is a huge extension of power and I'm seeing a lot of New Zealanders that are unhappy about it. Uh, Wayne, I spy with five little eyes, something beginning with 1984. Why do New Zealanders not seem to care about key spying on them? Is it because they trust him? I think it would be interesting to do some survey research on this um, to see how important privacy is as a principle of life. Now, privacy is not paramount. I mean, there are questions of national security sometimes or preventing crime. We accept that. Some people have a high status accorded to privacy in their lives and others have a low status. I have a theory, um, and it would have to be tested, that maybe there's a bit of a generational issue here. Those young people who are brought up on Facebook, and Facebook's business model, remember, is premised on the blurring of the public and the private. That's mm. how Zuckerberg makes his money. Yeah. So people who are used to being very candid and, and telling private things about themselves to others online on a regular basis may not have the same um, political antennae um, concerning this bill as, as older people do, who mm. remember Muldoon, who remember the SIS, yeah. and remember the marches against the mm. SIS bill in 1977. So I'm just saying that the opposition um, to this bill, although it's not as strong as you would like, it may be about demographics. Colin, last night I found a leaked cable on WikiLeaks detailing how the NSA would have a paid position within the GCSB dated back to 2004. How certain are you that our intelligence agencies are working for Wellington and not for Washington? Oh, I don't think anybody's that certain, are they? I mean, I think we recognise we have uh, agreements regarding security. Mm. I mean, we, ha we know that we have um, US personnel, for example, working up at the Walkway Station. Yep, yep. Uh, we have made choices to be aligned uh, militarily, um, intelligence-wise, with other nations. I think the question is, where are these lines drawn? And how transparent is it? How many double checks are in place? I just think that for a New Zealand uh, citizen, we should know that the courts have as some sort of independent check on any surveillance. It should have gone to a court. That court should have considered, do we breach this private person's privacy? Is there cause? And know at least that we have that safeguard. For me, that's the bottom line safeguard that should be in place here. Uh, Wayne.com says he has evidence that Key knew about him well before Key publicly states he does. If.com reveals that evidence in his court case, how damaging will that be for Key? Well, I think it'll be very damaging, and I can't see how the Prime Minister wouldn't have known about .com, because you remember when he first applied for citizenship in New Zealand, that was a controversial case anyway. Mm. And so anybody around the Cabinet table would have been aware of that case, even before the raid on his mansion. So, yeah, I think it could be damaging. Oh, and let's not forget yeah. what one of the rationales is for expanding um, the intelligence services you know, um, footprint in New Zealand. This is about protecting the patch of music companies okay, and film companies in the US who are scared that their intellectual and private property, which they make their profits from, is going to be threatened by a new generation of new media companies, including those that might have the name Mega Upload. Mm. So um, uh, dot .com is quite right to say that this bill is partly targeted against him because there's a split within, the media capitalis within media capitalism between the old media who want to protect property rights mm. and the new media whose business model requires that property rights be trampled all over. Mm. And it's interesting and disturbing that this new bill in part is about working on behalf of corporates rather than states. If, if, if it turns out, if it turns out 
that he did know and 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 kim.com can prove it in court before key has said uh, publicly he was was aware of uh, kim.com and i think that's very difficult for most of us to understand how the prime minister could be credible could, in that could not possibly right right if that happens does key have to resign I'm not sure. We'll have to wait till the extradition hearing. Uh, it's not quite as bad as John Banks not being able to remember whether he had a well, right in his <laughs> is it, Look, isn't this what happens? It's a case of remembering, and at the end of the day, try and prove that in a court of law. I, I think Key has shown that he's very, very good at staying popular despite what's going on. So while, while people look at this and think, oh, yeah, I'm not too sure that that's quite the full truth, at the yep. end of the day, he has given the benefit of the doubt by voters at this time at least. Yeah, yeah. I it? agree that that popularity is, is tarnished somewhat, but in the reality, in reality, he's still one of our most popular you, prime ministers trust, and will even, be going into the next popular, election. Even though he's mm. popular and he, lets it, he goes into the next election, very, very popular. Should any prime minister of New Zealand, regardless of the political queue, left wing, right wing, in the centre, mm -hmm. Should they have this kind of power that seems to be quite unchallenged? It's a hell of a lot of power to put into one person's hands. Well, well, look, we have chosen to do that. I think the worry here is we're extending that power. You see, as the head of the intelligence agency, um, if we're extending the powers, as is proposed and as you say is gliding through Parliament right now, we're actually increasing the mm. power mm. resting with one person yeah. right at the top. Am I comfortable with that? Absolutely not. Uh, final question of both of you. With all the questions swirling over the GCSB, is it good enough, Wayne, that the Prime Minister appointed his childhood school chum as the head of the GCSB? Uh, no, you've got um, your sort of private collusion on top of institutional surveillance that's sort of making a bad situation even worse. Um, another thing I'm really disturbed about with this extension of powers in the bill um, is the widening definition of national security. Yes. Um, to include um, economic national security. Mm. And that means that any environmental protester, someone who doesn't want an oil rig off the coast of Taranaki, um, the same kinds of people who got spied upon um, down in Happy Valley on the yep. west coast of the South Island, that's going to be ramped up all through your social media. And that's pretty disturbing. Um, the other disturbing thing is the way that information is collected. Um, I've got three T's here, trawling, targeting and tracking. Trawling is when you just trawl for information on a, like on a fishing expedition to see what you can find out about people or groups of people. Um, targeting is when you identify a person and find out everything you can about them. Um, their emails, their cell phone usage and all the rest of it um, because presumably they're a threat to the state but in ways that they don't even know about. Okay? And the tracking is using GPS technology to identify people's movements. Now this is quite extraordinary. With so many questions over the GCSB, mm. it's just, it's not a good look, is it, for the Prime Minister to appoint his, his old mate from school? For oh, oh look, I mean, there have been a, a same process issue happened with Sky City, right? The Auditor General looked at that and said, can't see any Ill Ill illegal activity here, but, but it's, not, but it's not good process. And I think this is the point, isn't it? Maybe he was the best choice, but it should have been done through a different process. Mm. And that Having way we all have the confidence. Him yeah. It's right. just, come on. Hey, <laughs> it's broken so many rules. Put in, a, put in a CV a alongside a number yep. of other, yep. have it considered by an independent panel yep. where anybody who's personally conflicted says, I'm not yep. taking yep. part, yep. Yep. And, uh, and come up with the best decision. We may have picked the same guy anyway, sure. but at least sure. Sure. we would have known that the right process had been yep. followed. And with so many questions now yep. over the GCSB, it you would have been better, you, it would have been a be and, much better look. And you're also now in a that. position, are you not, to question whether or not um, his advice to Key is what's best for New Zealand, or is he looking after his old I, mate? I, look, I, I think the wrong process has always opened that door. Better not to have a conflict of interest, yeah. better to have as much transparency as you can. Are environmentalists and unionists... Are they, I mean, obviously, you, you may not, they may not be your, 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 your line of we, friends. We know or, we have a number yep, of supporters yep, okay. from that sector. But are they, are they dangers? Are they people that need to be tracked by the GCSB? You know, by and large, I would say no. I think if someone makes some sort of visible public threat, I think if somebody carries out a crime, uh, you know, serial bomber or something like that, hey, I want surveillance, I yeah, want yeah, security. Yeah, 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 yeah. But, but someone just, who's doing a just letter somebody, writing campaign. Yeah, look, just someone who wants to write a letter and keeps it, you know, within the bounds of civility, leave them alone. They haven't committed a crime.
Moving on with issue three. Thank you, panel. While Auckland got its rail link, there was debate about banning beggars from Queen Street. Colin, if the government has accepted that Auckland needs a rail link, why does Auckland have to wait till 2020 <laughs> before we can even start building it? That's oh. seven more years in traffic, oh. isn't it? Oh, look, you're absolutely, look, this was a smoke and mirrors announcement, wasn't it? I mean, this was John Key taking credit for these things but not doing them. Mm. The reality is it's put on the back burner. If you look at the markers that, or the, the sort of the qualifiers that they set, you know, you've got to have this many people, you've got to have min this many people riding the trains. Hey, it's never going to happen. It's way off in the future. Now, I'm not totally unhappy about that in the sense that I don't believe that it qualifies economically as a priority. Um, having but the business community in Auckland certainly see it. Oh, they, they yeah. Oh, I would, I would dispute Look, that. Look, at actually. the end of the oh, at the oh. end of the day, at the end of the day, John Key's made an announcement to win some brownie points, but he's not going to be the prime minister when it gets done. Is, is, it, is it smart politics by Key? Twenty twenty, he's not going to be in power. It's not smart politics, and uh, what I think the Labor and the Greens should do is make a joint announcement that if they form the next government, they will start the city rail loop in Auckland immediately. Right. And I think that would really benefit them on polling day. I really do. Look, this is just a, this is a kind of a nasty Auckland versus Wellington thing going yeah. on here. It's, it has a long history, a long genealogy. But from the national government's point of view now, it's quite hypocritical because wasn't it them who advocated setting up the super city? <laughs> yes. Was, yes. So that Auckland would right. have more authority to um, deal yes. with its own problems. Well, unless it says something Wellington doesn't want to hear. Then it's get rid of it. <laughs> we right. need to change it. And I, I, I disagree with Colin. I, I think the business community is in Auckland is right behind the rail loop because the more and more that we get snarl-ups, and the snail ups are not happening at commuter peak times anymore. They're happening right through Every the day. day. Especially right. if you have a wet day oh. and it's after school it's and mental. there's an accident on the southern mm. motorway and mental. another one on the bridge. Yeah, the entire and then the, but, the, the but now you're talking roading. Push. But now you're talking roading. I think the roading is a priority. It's the rail loop. No, no, no you've got to build, you've got to build in the rail loop first. Oh, no. We, see, we need good through roads in Auckland. Oh, I think... Roading through Auckland is Businesses something you can operate. rightfully ask the rest of New Zealanders to pay for. Yeah. With the rail loop, I believe Auckland takes responsibility, and if it chooses to fund it, then it can proceed. But, the, but I don't but see the, but why Wellington... decades and decades and decades of underfunding that Wellington hasn't shown Auckland, we do some money, aren't we? And I'm saying we need to put it into key things like a second crossing, which has a much higher economic no, return. Rail's and even first. that's been put on the back burner, and to me that's unacceptable. Final any, question. any business in Auckland that requires driving across Auckland is actually losing money. Final question to both of you. Uh, keeping with Auckland, there has been talk of banning beggars in Queen Street. Is the idea worth merit? Very interesting issue, this. Um, I think certain business people who are going to not sort of stand up and be counted, but certain retail business people in Auckland I would like our ribbon shopping developments, including Queen Street, uh, Only Hunger, would like those to go the same way as shopping malls, where you have private security just clearing people out mm. so that um, consumption and shops can operate unmolested. Uh, my point of view, leave the beggars there. That's where, that's where New Zealand society is at, a, is at the moment, and people should have their noses rubbed in it. Any yeah. beggars on Queen Street? Oh, I'm not, look, I'm not into rubbing anybody's nose in it. Look, it is public space though and I think that's quite right the differentiation here between a shopping mall and a street is this is public space people have a right to be there they have a right to talk within reason and politely in an unthreatening way to others so I think whatever activity whether it's busking um, begging um, trying to convert them to come along to your local club or sports mm, facility mm. go for it uh, petition you know signing the petition that's where I signed the space. petition and public, yep, space. public space we must keep public space open as much as possible to everybody yes you need to be respectful but it's not a shopping mall and you've got to accept public have the right to be there and the right to carry out lawful activity let's wrap the show with final word Wayne your final word this week is let me address surveillance again there's an iron law here as social media becomes more pervasive, as people become more connected, as they become more dependent on their portable phones, on their PCs, on Facebook and other social media, then that capacity to converse with others is the same capacity that can have them surveilled. So the prospects of being surveilled by an outside force, whether it be from corporates or the state, increases at the same time as our capacity to communicate increases. And that's the iron law that we have to confront here because um, I think the world as a whole is at a turning point. Either we have scrutiny of this kind of surveillance through social media in different countries and internationally, 
or we give up the candle. Colin, your final word? I'm going to talk transport, Auckland transport. Uh, we, we want the best bang for buck. And I think we, we often don't get it with our infrastructure spend. Um, I think we do need to look at a bridge. It's the second crossing in Auckland City. It is far cheaper. It can be very iconic. It can be done far quicker. We need to get the cars moving, reduce pollution, increase economic output and productivity. A bridge is the best option. And to, for a government who's prepared to write itself its own laws to say, well, the problem blocking it is that we can't get consents. Hello, wake up. You do everything else you want to do. Let's go for the best spin. Be smart. Thank you, Colin. Thank you, Wayne. Ladies and gentlemen, to my final word. I've lived in the inner city now for about two decades, and I currently live on Queen Street. These beggars that many are wanting banned, they're my neighbours. I always drop off change if I have any spare in my pockets and bake cakes and donate those at Christmas to them. Why? Because there but for the grace of God go I. I walk with my three-year-old daughter down past them and she asks who they are. I tell her they are people who have it far worse than us and that they deserve our sympathy and support. She always wants to buy them chocolate cookies. In my direct dealings with the beggars, they have always been funny, gentle, embarrassed and sad. Terribly sad. Sometimes they get a bit raucous, but that's mostly amongst themselves. They get hassled by the police a lot. It is not an existence that deserves to get harsher, and that's exactly what banning begging would do. Most of the time, the beggars are a nasty prick to our conscience of the lie that is the pretense of egalitarian New Zealand in the 21st century. What banning them is really about is to erect a blind spot so that we don't have to see their pain, their poverty, their reality. These are the unpeople. They don't live, they exist. And the desire to ban them is to save us from having our conscience shamed. If we aren't going to raise a hand to help them, where do we get the moral authority to raise one to hurt them? Tonight, I, with dozens of other Aucklanders, will be sleeping rough to raise funds for LifeWise to help the homeless. You can still donate if you're able. Uh, these people have nothing. Let's give them something more than abuse. If you like tonight's show, please join our Citizen A Facebook site, connect with other like-minded news citizens, and follow me on my Citizen Bomber and Twitter Facebook page. Thanks for watching Fano. Good night, Aitera. Supporting local content so you can see more of New Zealand on air.